Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are joined, I guess for the last time of this series, by Mr. Paul Wells. Paul, welcome back. Thank you, Bart. Great to be here again. Yes. Uh, so people watching this, uh, I'm assuming they've they've learned that we have kind of switched the order around on them. We've kind of talked a lot about pretty much in every episode, we screwed up the order as we discussed it. We said part two would be symbols. It's now part four. So Garrison yeah. was on part three. You have not seen that yet because I recorded it two days ago yeah. uh, at the time of recording this. But it's awesome. You'll enjoy it when it comes out. Uh, I can't big wait thanks to see to, Garrison for doing that. Yeah. So today's the big one because Tony is famous for his cymbals. Yes. And a lot of other things, his drumming, but his cymbals kind of live in, in infamy uh, on their own. So Indeed. we got a lot to talk about. So I know you wanted to talk about some other stuff that you uh, from the previous episodes, whatever you want to do first. Why don't we hop in? Yeah, thank you. So this happened when we did the Neil episodes um, that uh, we did the episodes and either um I realized after we filmed them that I forgot something. So in like part two, I had some things to add from part one, but also uh, some some awesome people uh, commented on um, part one and part two so far and have um, brought some things to light. Um, but also in the in the week since we did them, I've been doing some more research and found out a few extra things. So um, I wanted to amend a couple of things and actually leave. There was something that uh, and actually very big omission that I left out of, um, I guess it would have been, it should have been in part two where we talked about backline kits. Um, there's a very famous one that I just somehow completely forgot to talk about. So, hmm. um, but before I get to that, I want to talk about, um, I want to rewind to 1971, 1972. And there was some question about, um, the kit or kits that you see in various photos and videos from 71 and 72, where, where Tony was touring with various bands, his own band, and then this other band with um, Jean-Luc Ponty and Stanley Clark. Um, we actually discovered, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, when we were talking about this kit from 1971 and these photos um, taken by... Um, uh, uh, photographer, uh, Jan Persson, Persson in, um, Copenhagen. As we are talking, I think we noticed that this bass drum actually has 10 lugs per head, um, mm -hmm. which is very unusual. And I still think that that's an 18 inch bass drum, but very, very unusual for an 18 inch bass drum from Gretsch to have 10 lugs per head. Gretsch had, um, I think at some point, maybe, no, actually they still make twenties with, so their 16 inch, 18 inch and 20 inch bass drums all have eight lugs per head. And it's not till you get to 22 inch bass drums that you see uh, 10 lugs per head, but this is a certainly smaller than a 22. And you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. And now you do see that with Gretsch 18s when somebody has converted a floor tom because by the mid 70s, Gretsch floor toms in the 18 inch size, Gretsch 18 inch floor toms had 10 lugs per head. Um, but that's sort of even mid 70s, I believe, or at least it's not really in this time frame. So who knows why he had all those extra, he had two extra lugs. But what's important about this is that it makes us, it, it makes it clear that this next kit from 72 is actually a different kit. And we thought maybe he had cleaned up, like he had, he had, you know, an artist or somebody had done all these designs on his 71 kit and maybe he, you know, sort of cleared them up and had a clean, you know, version of the same kit. But this is actually a different kit because, or certainly a different bass drum because this is an eight lug per head bass drum. Yeah. Now yeah. it's a little hard to see in this photo um, and in fact, all of the photos I have from the 72 kit, but there is a lot of video footage of this kit. There are a couple of extensive videos of him in 72 that you can see, including one where he's doing um, a lot of duets with Art Blakey that is very, very cool. And you could see lots of great shots from the front of the kit. And you can see that it's an, a, a, probably an 18 inch bass drum with eight lugs per head. So different kit. Also, I have since seen an I'm afraid I don't have screenshots of it prepared, but again, you can go on YouTube and look at these. Um, I have since seen color videos from 71 where you can definitely see that this kit in 71 is a natural maple finish kit. Um, and there also is now, there's color footage 
from one song from the 1972 concert with Jean-Luc Ponty and Stanley Clark that is in color. Um, and it's not a colorized video. It's actually the actual footage in color. And you can see that it's a yellow kit. And this photo too, um, 1972 live one. I mean, you can, it, the, you know, the tint is a little bit, you know, it sort of looks like it's maybe in the sunset and the lighting's a little off. But, you know, we were pretty sure that this is probably yellow and this video definitely confirms that. So it's a separate kit, different bass drum, different lug, you know, um, set up on the bass drum altogether. So that's an interesting find. Um, yeah. The other um, really big omission is when we're talking about backline kits, I forgot to mention one of the most famous examples of Tony using backline, which is at the uh, 1972 Montreux Jazz Festival. Um, Tony was there playing with Stan Getz's quartet with Chick Corea on Rhodes and piano, and again, Stanley Clark on bass. And um, also on that same bill at Montreux in 72 was the Chuck Mangione Quartet featuring Jerry Nywood on saxophone, Tony Levin on bass and a very young Steve Gadd on drums. And mm. Steve Gadd has talked about this in a lot of interviews. He talked about playing that um, festival with Chuck and that Tony borrowed Steve's drums. And Tony used Steve's drums at this festival. And there is video footage of both of these bands um, playing Montreux 72. And although there are some things that are different, you can see that it is the same kit. So um, we have this photo of Steve in 72 at, at, um, at Montreux. Um, now, unfortunately, the only video really of this that's on YouTube, somebody uploaded it, but they uploaded it without sound. And they have yeah. this watermark that tells you that you should order it with sound by emailing <laughs> this gentleman. But we see this kit. It's a, it's a 12, 14, 18 stop sign badge era Gretsch in um, walnut finish. Um, and, you know, there's some interesting things like the, uh, the, the four point rail mount, um, which was sort of the later rail mount that Gretsch used starting in the early seventies. Um, so, if you look at the symbol stands, though, these I think are sort of classic of the era Gretsch symbol stands. I can't really tell what the hi-hat stand is, but, um, you know, you have Gad playing this kit. And then if we look at these photos of Tony, um, like uh, this one, this nice shot from the front, 12, 14, 18, stop sign, walnut, Gretsch kit. And, uh, you know, this, this confirms what, um, what Steve Gadd said that Tony is there at the festival playing what appears to be, Gr uh, Gadd's Gretsch kit. Now, what is different is if you notice the symbol stands and the hi-hat stand are not the same symbol stands that, that Gadd was using. So hmm. I wonder if maybe Tony brought his trap case to Europe with him, you know, maybe brought a trap case with his hardware symbols and, you know, sticks, um, but otherwise didn't bring drums. Um, sure. It must have been yeah. because he's not, you know, these are not Steve's cymbal stands. Um, and what's also very interesting, I know we're going to talk about cymbals, but I want to talk about this right now since we have this, this kit sort of, we're talking about this. Tony is not likely using his own cymbals or, I mean, he may have been given these cymbals, but um, famously uh, the Peisty Cymbal Company, um, who is located in Switzerland, the factories in Switzerland in the seventies, they were pretty famous for, they would bring symbols to the Montreux jazz festival for various drummers to try out. Hmm. And they were, you know, hoping to, you know, Peister were still kind of building their brand at that point. And I think they were hoping to get some people converted to their symbols and sign some artists, which they definitely did. Um, there were a lot of jazz artists that signed with Peisty in the seventies. Now, Tony never signed, but, he apparently did receive a set of symbols. Which maybe he took to Africa. Possibly, yeah, because later we see um, at least a 2002 crash um, on the, uh, the, the footage from um, Tony Williams in Africa. But here's a nice yeah. close-up of Tony's symbol. You can very clearly see here, Peisty 2002 logo just below yep. the bell. Um, but these are the symbols that he's using on this, on this uh, Stan Getz concert. Now, yeah. he may have used these symbols for exactly just this one gig and then never played them again, or he may have used them for the whole tour. We don't know, but it's, it's likely that he got them at Montreux 
because Paiste, as I said, were in the habit of, you know, giving symbols out for, for artists to try. Um, yeah. I mean, I, but really com- comparatively to like the earlier kits, like the kind of junky looking Rogers kit that was falling apart. Oh yeah. It's a pretty, pretty nice backlight. It's a, kit. Yeah, mean, it one, is. It is. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I would imagine Tony was pretty happy to, to get this kit and it sounds really, yeah. really great. Um, the, there's an entire, concert is available on video of the Stan Getz Quartet uh, at Montreux in 72. And it's fantastic. And Tony plays brilliantly and the drums sound really great. Um, so yeah, it was definitely a, uh, it was a happy day for him, I think to, to yeah. get a, to get a nice kit like that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention as far as Tony's drums that I left out. Um, and I, again, I don't have any photos, but Tony on his, um, record of uh, from 1986 called foreign intrigue which was sort of his return to leading a jazz group his his groups had be you know from 69 on it really been fusion groups and kind of got even more and more into the sort of rock side of fusion but in 86 he started leading a new band and the it was an acoustic jazz band mostly acoustic um and that record for an intrigue was really the start of that. And it was based around his compositions. And I encourage everybody to check out these, uh, that band and these records because it's brilliant music, brilliant playing. Um, and that very first record, Tony had the idea to incorporate electronic drums into this otherwise acoustic jazz record. And, it's it's a bit bizarre, frankly. I think it's 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 a really bold idea. I'm not entirely sure it works. Um, very few people have incorporated. I mean, Bill Bruford actually very very successfully incorporated electronic drums into an acoustic jazz group with his the original incarnation of his band Earthworks. Um, mm. But uh, Tony was also doing that and. Um, in Tony's Modern Drummer interview in 1984, he talks about this a little bit. Um, he talks about, uh, uh, you know, he, he wants to incorporate electronics into his next project. And the only specifics he says, um, I'm going to quote from this interview, is um, he says, I like the Lin, meaning the Lin drum, the drum machine. I like the Lin, I like the Oberheim DMX, and I like the Roland. Right now it's a matter of sound. The DMX has the capability for me, and the snare sound is really hot. I also have a set of Simmons. So that's as specific as he gets as far as what he's using on this record. Um, And I don't know if he's maybe triggering some DMX sounds with a Simmons brain, but what I hear... You know, I'm not a, I'm not an expert on Simmons drums, but I know a little bit about them. I hear actually some Simmons SDS five, and I also hear Simmons SDS seven sounds. Um, mm-hmm. Those two brains have very distinctively different sounds. Um, yeah, and I hear both of those on that record for an intrigue. So I think he may have had both. Um, but anyway, that's that's as much as I can tell you about the electronics. But they are on that record, yeah. and it's and it's worth checking out. So that gets the stuff out of the way that I, that I missed. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've tried to do that as quickly as I could, cause I really want to get into the symbols and, um, you know, that's, that's, yeah, the symbols are, are, are really magic with Tony. And, and of course, you know, a large part of it is simply the way that he plays the symbols, the technique his his touch, his technique, um, you know, the way he hits them, his concept, what he's hearing, all of that stuff is, is, you know, probably yeah. more important than the actual symbols, but the symbols are important. And a lot of people have a lot of questions about them, speculation and stuff. Um, I, what I don't want to do is I don't want to give any background on, you know, I mean, he's famous for using old K Zildjian's. If anybody doesn't know what an old K is, um, a K Zildjian made in Istanbul, there are plenty of other places to learn that stuff. I'm not going to give a history lesson on, on the Zildjian companies and i'm not going to talk about the different stamps that you know for identifying the era or anything like that and it's all speculative anyway because i don't know what stamps were on tony's symbols um unfortunately that has not been documented so um i don't want to speculate on that i just kind of want to give an overview of what 
I know that he used and um, look at some pictures and talk about maybe a little bit about why they sound great. Yeah, and I think it's important to say that um, there, I did an episode about uh, the stamps and identifying vintage A's. I plan to do mm. one about vintage K's. It's a different beast altogether. Yeah. But uh, but just and then before we move forward again to not to keep the history straight, A Zildjian and K Zildjian are separate companies. They're competing. It's almost parallel to like Sabian and Zildjian nowadays, where kind like of. they're related, but they're not the same company. They're in competition. Right. Uh, like you said, K's are made back in, in Turkey and in Istanbul. Um, Gretsch was a distributor of K, which I think right. plays into this. Yes, that uh, is true. Yeah, I mean, just briefly, I guess, K Zildjian's handmade in Turkey, hand hammered, tended to sound darker. A Zildjian's um, made in Boston, um, somewhat b- more by machine, a little bit more automated, but but tend to be brighter little brighter, a little cleaner sounding. But um, beyond that, um, I think everybody... That's all we're saying. (laughs) Yeah, that's all. You know, a lot of you guys probably know this stuff anyway. And those who don't, you've you've got a really fun deep dive on your hands because it is amazing history. But um, the the basis of Tony's setup um, through more or less until we get to the early 70s is simply a ride, a crash, and a pair of hi-hats. And, um, other than a couple little variations, it's basically that, um, it's, it's basically a 22 inch ride, an 18 inch crash, 14 inch hi hats. And I do want to make the distinction that the left symbol as a crash, mostly for him, 99.9% of the time was just a crash symbol. There's like two or three times in the 60s that you can hear him ride on that symbol. Um, one that comes to mind, if anybody has the Charles Lloyd record called Of Course, Of Course, if you listen to the tune, um, The Best Thing For You Is Me, um, on the the opening head of the tune on the bridge, he rides on the 18 for just the eight bars of the bridge or whatever it is. Um, That's one example that I know where he uses it. I think there's also one or two points on the plug nickel recordings where he may ride on the crash for just like a second. Um, Oh, the uh, the intro to the first tune, the beginning of the very first tune on Andrew Hill's point of departure. He's riding on the, uh, on the, on the right symbol, I believe. Uh, Sorry, on Mm, the left symbol, but mostly, mostly it's a crash, mostly for Tony ride, crash, (laughs) hi-hats. He actually rode on the hi-hats way more than he ever rode on the, on the crash. Mm. Um, He actually used that sound quite a bit. This episode is brought to you by Masters of Maple. Masters of Maple is proud to present the 323 snare drum. The 323 is a love letter to Los Angeles. It embodies everything about where Masters of Maple is from and where this drum is made. It's dark, gritty, and has just enough flash to make it in Hollywood. This drum comes in two sizes. There's a 6.5x14 and and an 8x14. Each size is limited to a production run of 12 drums. It's got a 1.2mm pure copper shell. It features the new Masters of Maple stump badge and has black nickel plating. The snare comes with a trick multi-step throw-off, and you have the option of choosing split lugs or tube lugs, or die cast or triple flange hoops, so you get to customize this drum. You can pre-order the 323 right now at mdrums.com before it goes live for sale on December 8th, 2023. This is a limited production run and it will go fast. So head over to mdrums.com to learn more. Thanks to Masters of Maple for sponsoring this episode. So briefly, the hi-hats are 14s. They're old Ks. They're on the heavier side. I'll talk about weights down the road because again we don't have weights exactly but we can speculate on weights a bit but i will get to that but they're they're on the chunky side um heavy ish um they've got a bright chick sound a really strong but also a lot of overtones a lot of dark trashy stuff going on when he rides on them it's amazing sounding hi-hats and they're great jazz hi-hats but also when you get into the later 60s and they start doing some kind of more backbeat sort of funkier rhythms like the tune stuff with um miles Mm. davis's quintet um they work great as sort of like funky backbeat kind of hi-hats the 18 is not a k the 18 is an a um and the best photos of it really are the photos um that we'll look at later of the um you know when when istanbul mamet uh make their 
Tony signature series, which are copies of these symbols. And they published some really good modern photos of Tony's originals. Um, but you can pretty clearly see in those photos that it's a, a type bell, a type hammering. It's all very typical. Um, people that know vintage symbols probably already know this, but you take one look at that 18, you know, it's a, you know, it's an A. Yeah. The 22. Now, this is where the real, this is, this is the legend. This is the, the, the stuff of legends. This is the stuff that people just endlessly talk about and geek out about and think about. And I've certainly spent, um, I mean, I think I started listening to Tony so sometime in high school and was immediately attracted to that sound and that amazing, the way, the, the sound and the way he plays it and the sounds he draws out of it. And it's, it's, you know, we, we honestly, I, I don't know. I don't think anybody really can say whether he had one symbol all through the sixties or multiple symbols. Um, there's a lot of speculation that there were multiple symbols, but he definitely had a sound in his head. And if he had numerous symbols, they're all kind of in the same ballpark where they all have this really great woody stick, sort of a clicky stick. Yeah. He would be such a great technician of the instrument too if he did have more than one he could probably go through a, a pile of symbols and find exactly the one that matches closely to the one he's looking for yeah you know, well you if know he what, wanted th to this would be a good time to to talk about, actually to bring this up is there's a really great well there are a couple of quotes from him where he talks about the k he talks about his k ride symbol and the first quote is from the same modern drummer interview that i just um read from about the simmons drums um june 1984 modern drummer um so the interviewer who is um a gentleman named rick mattingly who uh, interviewed a lot of the great jazz drummers for modern drummer um rick asks him he says um, I've often heard you equated with the K sound more than any other single person. And Tony says, great, fantastic. The K sound. I got that from Max, actually. Years ago, I think it was 1960, I came to New York to visit Max. I had met him, I think, in 1959 or 58. He was kind enough to let me play with his band. Actually, he let me come up and sit in. I was about 12 or 13. Anyway, I went to visit him, and we went to the old Gretsch factory in Brooklyn. I met Mr. Gretsch, Fred Gretsch. At this time, they had K. Zildjian's at the factory. Max said, here, why don't you take this one? This sounds great. Max started me on that sound, a big, high, dark sound. That's the ride symbol I have. It's a high tone, but the symbol itself is a dark sound. I learned that definitely, among other things, from Max. So this ties into yeah. what you were saying before about Gretsch being the distributor of K Zildjian. Um, you know, K's were made in Turkey and then shipped over to the Gretsch factory in Brooklyn, and then Gretsch would distribute them. They would send them to all of the dealers. And um, Gretsch artists could also go to the Gretsch factory and pick out. They had probably thousands of old K's um, there at the factory, so artists could pick symbols you know from a from a lot like have a huge selection to pick sure from. so yeah. max you know tony is is coming you know visiting from boston going to new york to visit max max takes him to the factory they're probably poking around playing some symbols and max is like "Ooh, listen to this one why don't you take it tony here you go <laughs> yeah. and that's yeah, the, the, the guy who like is in charge of the symbols is like uh okay i guess you can take it <laughs> I, no that would have been phil Whatever. grant that would have been phil grant yeah. who was among other things uh, you know artist relations for gretch at that time and he's the one who signed all of these great new york city jazz drummers art yeah. blakey kenny clark art taylor jimmy cobb um elvin tony uh charlie persip all these great drummers phil grant was the one who signed them and he probably yeah. would have been the one who was taking them around showing them the factory and and that yeah. probably would have been through phil's approval that tony could take that symbol home but yeah interesting it that it, yeah. it and it caught max's ear max was like oh this is really good man you should take this yeah presumably that's the symbol or at least one of the symbols that that tony is playing um i love the way he describes it too a big high dark sound and those are three sort of conflicting um descriptors high aren't they and dark high Don't yeah usually go yeah but then, but then he clarifies he says it's a high tone but the symbol itself is a dark sound and and i mean really that does you know really good old k's have 
everything from like very low frequencies all the way up with this amazing mid range. Um, and, and some of the stick sound is from the mid range, but also these sort of swirly breathy overtones. I often describe yeah. the overtones as having this sound, like, like somebody's going, ah. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. this breathing sound. It's, it's, it's sure. amazing and swirling sort of uh, sometimes slightly conflicting overtones, but builds they all on make, itself to, yeah, yeah. And they just make amazing music and, and Tony's symbol, man, it's, it's one it has one of the best washes wash being you know the sustaining undertone of the you know, sort of below the stick sound that sort of sustains um and sort of connects the beats that you play with the stick and it's just such an incredibly musical sound it's such a beautiful you know complex combination of overtones and it and i've really just i mean i've heard some really great old k's i've heard great new zildjans i used to play istanbul agop and had some great symbols from them and I, I a lot of my symbols have had bits of this but i've never really heard anything even you know maybe some other old k's but man nothing that just has that mm. right perfect combination like tony's symbol had yeah and it's yeah. really something very very special i don't think it's an accident that people obsess about this symbol so much it really is one of the greatest symbols of all time it's meant to be i mean max roach picking it up tony yeah. visiting yeah someone could yeah. have grabbed it the day before and taken it home but they didn't and and it worked out for history right. you know right unbelievable yeah there's a good quote from a drummer named Terry Clark, um, who is a great drummer, um, from Canada and, um, uh, played with Jim Hall among a lot of other people, really, really amazing drummer. And he talks about sitting down on Tony's kit, going to see Tony and getting to, I don't think he necessarily sat in with the band, but he got to sit down at Tony's kit at a gig in the sixties. So, um, this is from June, 1983 modern drummer interview with Terry Clark. Um, and Terry, this is, this is Terry speaking and Tony's kit. He had that beautiful K Zildjian symbol that started everyone looking for old K's because he got such a good sound. But after playing it, I realized it wasn't so much the symbol as the way he played it. He had that wrist snap to his playing. I couldn't get it. Back in 65, I sat down behind his kit and that symbol was very hard to play a real garbage can lid. <laughs> <laughs> so garbage can, can lid. So maybe, you know, if drummers aren't necessarily, you know, jazz drummers or they don't have an ear for a certain type of sound, um, K's can, they can, they don't always, some of them are very clean and clear sounding, sort of like we associate a Zildjian's, but K's can have, especially if the symbol has a bit of an umbrella shaped profile, can have a lot of what we call trashy overtones, which I think is sort mm -hmm. of like overtones and sort of musical notes that conflict with each other and you know sometimes that ah thing can almost be an aggressive and almost like ugly sounding note but we also yeah. sometimes really like that too and um i think what terry clark is talking about when he says a, a trash can lid or a garbage can lid is that sort of and again maybe younger people have never seen a metal garbage can but, you know, before these sort of like plastic tub garbage cans that we think of, okay. garbage cans in, you know, the 19, in the 20th century were most likely to be um, metal, made of metal. Yeah. So Oscar think of the Oscar the Grouch, Grouch right? <laughs> Perfect. Yes, thank you. We were, we were right on the same page yes. there. Oscar yes. the Grouch is, it lives in the type of garbage can we're talking about. And the lid yes. was just this flat, round lid, slightly simple shaped. And you can imagine if you pick that off, just this piece of like tin or whatever and hit it with a stick, it would just sound pretty ugly, right? It would just kind of sound like kind of clanky and trashy. Like it would have this yeah. weird sort of, and that's what I think what people sort of mean by trashy or describing something as a garbage can lid, it just sort of junky sounding. But um, a lot of jazz drummers like that. It, it, it can create character and it can blend really well with an acoustic jazz group. Sometimes those higher mid-range overtones will sit really nicely with an upright acoustic bass um yeah. they also can sound really great behind trumpets and 
tenor saxophones, particularly. There's just something about mm. that kind of overtone that really works a lot of the time with the jazz group. If you want to hear yeah. what I mean, just listen to Tony. Listen to Tony on Miles Smiles by Miles Davis from 1966, I think. Um, this is that that sound. I mean, you, you're not going to hear it in a better place. I mean, it's an amazing record, and it and it's beautifully recorded. You hear that sound. You hear exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, and um, there's kind of famous instances of you know people try a symbol and they go, oh god, that doesn't sound good. But you're right. Where in in certain situations, it's it's completely different. But yeah, um, yeah. Well, let's maybe we look at like some more of these pictures here and talk about like I know yeah. there's like the certain like he has felts. It looks like it's doubled oh, up yeah. in the picture. We've got yeah. the tape on the bottom. Uh, yeah. The symbols in intact. It sort of again famously becomes uh, it does. more and more ch- chewed up over right, time and right, it starts right. chipping away. So you mentioned the tape. There, there are numerous photos, um, such as this Gretsch ad, where you can see there's a little strip of tape on the bottom of the symbol. Now, in this photo, it looks like it could be black tape, almost like electrical tape, but it's a very thin strip. Um, there are other photos, like this one from '63. July 63, you can see. Now, that might be a different strip of tape. It's possible that's a different symbol even. Um, it's mm. also a 22-inch K, but that's obviously a white piece of tape. And it goes all the way from kind of the – almost just a, um, just past the bell hole all the way almost to the edge. But it's a thin strip. But Tony was obviously using that to kind of fine-tune the symbol to his taste. Now, if we look at this photo from a year or so later, October 64 – may or may not be the same symbol, but we also see a white strip of tape, roughly the same, you know, placement. And on the A as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. On the 18 on his left, we also see a piece of tape. And that piece of tape actually becomes, um, on the 18, becomes a good sort of identifier of how late in his career he actually continues to use that symbol. Because we see it in 72 and we can identify it by probably that same piece of tape. And there aren't a lot of other photos where you can see the, the the front of the symbol, the side of the symbol that faces the audience, at least not that I have here, um, from later than 64. But some other interesting yeah. identifiers, if we go to this photo, um, again, by Jan uh, Pearson uh, from October 64 in Copenhagen, um, if we look at Around the edge of the symbol, about two inches in from the edge, we see a very obvious tonal groove that seems to kind of extend. It's almost like, you know, it sort of looks like the rings of Saturn or something. Um, the tonal grooves come from the lathing of the symbol. Again, if you want to know what lathing is, there are lots of videos you can watch about how symbols are made. But lathing can create these, what they call tonal grooves. And there's a very obvious sort of tonal groove band that, as I said, is like maybe an inch or two inches in from the edge of the symbol. And we can see that consistently in a number of photos. Um, Here is a photo from the Village Vanguard, September, October, 1965. If you zoom in right around the, the point where he's playing the symbol, you can see that same sort of tonal groove yeah, and the wear. Yeah, we've talked about yeah. this in the past, but the wear spot, in which I found interesting to learn about how certain the edge of one side of the symbol might be a little bit heavier to make it always right. kind of lean towards that direction. Right, uh, right. Which gives that consistent, this is the spot you're hitting every time. Yeah. And man, that symbol has some serious wear on it. Yeah, I've heard drummers refer to that as the sweet spot, which could yeah. refer to, you know, the the spot in the symbol where it sounds the best. But it's also the spot, you know, where if there's a spot where it always sort of lays because of the weight, and you're always going to end up playing that spot. And you can see that, it, he's almost sort of worn away the patina by hitting that spot with his stick so many times. And, you know, yeah, it's interesting. Sure. I, I've talked to so many people about symbols and, you know, symbols are, are hammered, um, whether by machine or by hand. Um, you know, most symbols are, are, are hammered to kind of tune them, to fine tune them, to make them sound the way that they sound. And, and hammered also to, to change the shape and to change the pitch and all of these things. But, you know, once you get a symbol, hitting it with a stick 
is sort of a very, very, very mild form of hammering. True. It, you know, it does change the symbol, maybe just microscopically, but it, it can actually change the symbol. And you can see here, it's visually changed the symbol. It's actually like almost sort of worn away a little bit of the metal or something. And I've seen other symbols like this. My, my teacher in high school, the great Roger Humphreys in Pittsburgh, used to play a, an A Zildjian that he got in the 60s. And when I used to hang out with him in the early 90s, he had played every single gig since 1965 until about 1995 on this symbol. And really? we're talking about a guy who was playing pretty much every night of the week. And wow. that symbol had that same sort of patch of like sort of worn away, you know, it's almost slightly shinier from, it's almost like the stick sort of buff the symbol slightly or something. Yeah. But his symbol had the same sort of wear on it. Well, that makes me think too, and I don't want to jump ahead past things you want to talk about, but all right. So you're, so, so he was playing, your teacher was playing that symbol for so long and it sounds like it didn't get cracked. Whereas Tony's symbol has like a famous crack that happens. Which, right. In my, in my experience, I don't, you know, I, I've cracked or, 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 you know, I've cracked or I had like a little hairline crack in crashes and even some hi hats. Do you think, and this is total speculation, but I look at these straight stands that are kind of thin with these heavy rides and I'm like, did maybe the ride fall over and start a crack at some point? I know that's, we will never know that, but right, that's possible. Um, I mean, the, these were not the most heavy duty simple stands, you know. Um, yeah. no, nothing. And these you know, are some of the say, heaviest rides. Yeah, this you is the get, best. I guess, at the this time. is the best hardware you had in 1965. Sure. Was these Gretsch or Ludwig or Slingerland, whatever flat base stands. Now Rogers had slightly heavier stands maybe, but they, they were still prone to falling over. You're right. Or a wing nut would slip and the whole thing would come down, you know, or yeah. Yeah, that's possible. That is maybe how that crack started. We'll get to the crack in a little Speculation. bit. Speculation. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's possible, but also Tony, you know, as you get into 67, um, and certainly 68, Tony is playing harder and harder. He's sort of playing louder with the band and the band gets some, um, you know, well, by, by 68, at least in the studio, they start using some electric instruments. They start using electric bass and um, electric piano and things just kind of are getting louder. So it could have also just sort of been, you know, I guess, user error that he maybe was yeah. hitting the cymbal pretty hard and it could have yeah. cracked because of, you know, for that reason, too. Another thing to notice while we're on this picture from the Vanguard um, in 65 is that he has, he does have a felt on top. Some drummers, uh, particularly jazz drummers, will play without the felt. Um, but Tony, every photo I've seen of Tony using this symbol, he's got a felt on it and he's got it. It's not particularly loose. He's got, you know, the wing nut is clamped down somewhat tightly. Actually, the next photo we'll, we'll look at has um, even a little more of an extreme um in fact, let's look at the photo from 1967 in Seattle. You can see here, well, first of all, in this photo, you can see that same tonal groove um, about yep. an inch or so in from the edge of the symbol. Um, now, again, who knows? Maybe he had two symbols that had the exact same tonal groove. But, but that's a good fingerprint to like, I and, and I'm saying that is. ironically because this symbol is covered in what looked like fingerprints on the <laughs> yeah, bottom. Yeah, true, but, right. But yeah, that's a good good identifier is that this ring. Is, this is a couple years the later groove. after that last photo we looked at and this symbol is more tarnished for sure. And now we, yeah. we see that crack is starting to happen that we talked about. But also you can see that the, the, the wing nut there is, um, you know, is tightened down somewhat tight onto the felt and and what that does for anybody who doesn't know well for first of all it keeps the symbol from moving a whole lot um which may or may not be what he was going for but it also will just ever so slightly mute the symbol um yeah. you, you should experiment with this with your ride symbols see what it does if anybody hasn't tried this to really tighten the wing nut down on it because you're pushing that felt against the you know, the bell hole and the, and some of the bell of the symbol. And it'll kind of, it's not as extreme as putting tape on the symbol, but it does have an effect of kind of muting the symbol a little bit. And it's actually an interesting thing. Sometimes I'll, I'll do that in a room where, you know, everything is very loud and I need to kind of lighten up and play a little softer. I'll do that to just sort of takes a little bit of the edge off a symbol. Yeah. So, um, and not as permanent as not permanent, but as getting gunk of tape on the bottom yeah, of the right, symbol and stuff right, like that. So. Right. I so mean, if, am I, is it fair to say that like, I'm looking at photos from like 65, mm -hmm. 66. I mean, yeah. it seems like 
Seems like 67 is when that damage happened, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Well, this photo of him and Elvin in Japan in November of 1966, which we went over in the first yes. um, episode. It's um, photoshopped. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, right. No. It's not photoshopped, people. That actually <laughs> happened. Tony and Elvin and Art Blakey played a drum battle in Japan together. Yes. And we're on the same stage. They apparently were on drum risers. And yeah, anyway. Yep. Watch that episode for the full story. Um, yep. But the symbol, if it is in fact the same symbol, and we also can see that wing nut tightened down on the felt, um, we can also see the 18 has that strip of tape, and that strip of tape's looking a little worse for uh, the wear, too. Yes, but, definitely. But um, we don't see any damage on that ride symbol yet. As far as I can tell, it still looks more or less like it's intact. But if we look at the next photo, which I believe is from Chicago in 1967, but I could be wrong on that date. Um, but we see, again, we've got the symbol. I can't really make out the tonal groove, but I see a lot of the same patina that you see at the bottom in that Seattle photo. But now we see this chunk taken out of it. And um, it almost looks like somebody got hungry and like actually took a bite out of the symbol. <laughs> yes. It's sort of a mouth shaped chunk. Um, and yeah, yeah it, you know, and this was, you know, the symbol started to crack and this was sort of an early attempt, I guess, at trying to repair um, a crack in a symbol. And, and it looks like it maybe wasn't that well repaired. It's, it's hard to say. And who knows who, who may have done the repair. Maybe Tony tried to do it at home with some, you know, some sort of like heavy shears or something. I don't, well, I don't know. Well, that's an interesting, and we don't need to go down this road too far, but the interesting thought of if you have a crack starting, the the idea then would be to cut a non-jagged, yeah. like, like a, like a semi, like a half circle to just stop yeah. it from, but, but it, the, this does look still a little jagged. So I happen to, am, I'm lucky enough to actually have a 22 inch old K um, that I got from Jess Birch at um, Good Hands Drum Shop. And it actually has a lot of um, sort of cracks wow. uh, and damage to it, but it has this 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 chunk. So this was um, a series, there were a series of cracks here and Jess actually did this work. Um, Looks cutting good. The, cutting the cracks out and he did an amazing job. You can kind of see, you know, how smooth um, this is, yeah. I mean, I can actually put my finger on it and it's not cutting me or anything. Um, but this is, this is really, really good crack repair. Still, symbol still you know, sounds really good. It still sounds amazing. Yeah. I mean, this is like, yeah. it's, it's a really special symbol. Yeah. Um, cool. It, it doesn't sound like Tony's particularly it's, it's more of a kind of art Blakey sounding K, but, um, but yeah, it's a really nice one. And Jess did an amazing job. Um, unfortunately, Jess was not around in 1967 to help Tony with his symbol. <laughs> um, what a shame. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, again, I don't know exactly when this is, but I do know that this next photo from that we looked at a minute ago um, is from Seattle in 1967. And you can see that the crack is actually bigger at this point. Um, more of the symbol, I guess the crack sort of continued beyond where he had cut it out and then he or whoever tried to cut more more of the symbol out um and you know that this is it, it can kind of be a thing i mean i know people who have symbols i mean like i said mine you know just did this about four or five years ago and the crack hasn't spread i've, I've been very lucky i don't use it all the time like tony seems to have used his symbol all the time but um but I do, uh, you know, it hasn't it hasn't spread. But this symbol, obviously, you know, really had problems with that. I have one last photo that I believe is of the same symbol. It's it's it is a photo from the from the front of the symbol. So you see the underside. This is from uh, I believe in New York. I think it might be the Village Gate in 1968. Mm -hmm. When we see Miles, uh, I believe Wayne Shorter behind them. It's he's pretty obscured. We definitely can recognize Herbie Hancock waving at the camera or maybe saying no photos, no photos. Yeah. Um, but we do see Tony and we see his, uh, a little bit of his silver sparkle floor, Tom. And if you look at, if you really zoom in on, on this symbol repair and I actually, um, actually I have a photo here that I, I, I took, um, a couple of these photos and put them together. The photo on the left is is from the Istanbul Mehmet literature, and that's what Tony's symbol looks like today. And then on the right is this photo from 68 I just showed you, and it's a pretty similar 
Um, I mean, I yeah. would I would actually argue that is definitely the same symbol. It's the same crack. It's the same like amount of symbol cut off um, at this point. So it, the symbol really seemed to just continue to crack and continue to have pieces cut out of it. Um, and this is where you know um, we we get you know basically this is the point where Tony had to retire the symbol. And I want to play now. I I have this quote from. This is actually an audio clip of Tony in an interview with a gentleman named Ben Sidron. Uh, ben Sidron is a, 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 a jazz vocalist who did a series of interviews with a, a lot of jazz musicians called Talking Jazz. And you can actually find it on Ben's website. Um, this entire interview is excellent. But he asks Tony about, um, about his symbol, about this famous symbol. And this is what... Um, this is what Tony has to say about it. No, that sound that I had, the uh, the symbol I got, that that was given to me by Max Roach. Is that right? Yeah, that original symbol on the on the records, those, all those records that I did early on on Blue Note in Columbia, that symbol was uh, given to me by Max. Do you still keep it? I have it, but I can't play it. It's uh, years ago, it became broken and uh, repaired and broken again. So I have it in my... In my safe at home. Maybe that was the broken symbol you're yeah. referring to. Yeah. You can hear that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, he that's that's it. And Garrison, I don't want to jump too much between what he said and this and that, but he said yeah. he went in his garage oh. uh kind of music, you know, space with full of gear. He said he picked up an old army green bit like symbol bag that I believe matches actually one of those Japan pictures of them outside of the hotel oh. he's got a snare case that looks very similar oh, or a drum wow. or a drum bag but it's the same you know whatever yeah. uh, that might have been a gretch gretch you, you made like sort of yes. burlap yes yeah. burlap or i don't want to say wow. denim with some, something like that yeah. canvas wax canvas yeah. or something but yeah anyway he said he picked it up and he was like put it down i don't want to talk about it and he said oh it's the symbol it had it was completely chewed up yeah it was these three symbols or four you know the hi-hat but um Oh, so man, that's yeah, that's the stuff of dreams for me. But yeah, you'll hear that wow. episode. Soon. I can't wait. I can't <laughs> wait, man. Um. Anyway, so yeah, that that's that's the last photo I know of of that symbol until we get into the you know when Mamet copied it. Um. You know, yeah. very recently. But um. So I also want to address um the Nefertiti ride. Um. So this is a symbol that um Wallace Roney. Um, owned and that he got from Tony. Um, so if anybody who doesn't know, uh, I mean, again, like Google Wallace Roney. Um, Wallace Roney was an amazing trumpet player and amazing musician and a really important mentor to a lot of uh, younger musicians and, and, and uh, just a, a really, really wonderful guy who sadly passed of uh, COVID early on in the pandemic, um, died Terrible. much too young. Yeah, very tragically. And um, he, uh, so I mentioned that record earlier on for an intrigue, Tony's return to acoustic jazz. Um, Wallace Roney is the trumpeter on that record and on all of um, uh, Tony's acoustic quintet records of the late 80s and early 90s. And they're all brilliant. and and Wallace was a very, very important part of that band. And then also went on to play with basically the Miles Davis 60s quintet who reunited as the tribute to Miles quintet. And and Wallace kind of came in and played the trumpet parts with those guys in, uh, I think mm. it was 92 or 93. And he was very, very, very close with Tony. Um, he just absolutely loved Tony and and got to know him very, very well. And um, he was interviewed in Modern Drummer magazine in February 1999. And this is the first place where he recounted this, uh, this story. He talks mostly about Tony in this interview. It's a great interview done by the writer uh, Bruce Whitted, who is a friend of mine and a, a really, really marvelous writer who wrote a lot for Modern Drummer magazine. And um, there's a lot that, um, that Wallace says about... Um, about Tony's symbols. And this story is really amazing because, so I'm going to read from this Modern Drummer interview with Wallace. Um, he talks about um, being at Tony's house, basically, uh, I guess, similar to what, what um, 
you just told me Garrison described, but yeah. Um, so he says, uh, this is a quote from Wallace. Um, he opens up this huge crate about six feet long and three feet wide. It's full of brand new, never used old K's from the forties and fifties. My heart stopped. <laughs> I mean, I can imagine, <laughs> yeah, right? <it's> unbelievable. <laughs> My heart stopped. He's laughing, saying, go ahead, pick a set, which I love that Wallace's heart is stopping and then Tony is just laughing at him because Tony knows yeah. how much of a, a a nerd Wallace was for this stuff and how much he revered yeah. Tony and pick Tony's sound. Set. Yeah, oh, man. go ahead, pick a set, meaning pick a set of symbols. I started feeling guilty. I didn't want to take his symbols. <laughs> right at the end of the crate were the older old Ks. I felt better about taking them because they were retired and he wouldn't miss these as much as the ones he hadn't got to yet. I picked three ride symbols, two sock symbols, a very thin 15-inch pair and a 14-inch pair, and a 20 and an 18-inch. The ones I liked best were the three 22-inch rides, and he let me take them. So think about that. You know, he's 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 picked out three <laughs> 22-inch rides from Tony's stash of old Ks. Man, um, priceless. Yeah. As I was going, he asked me, do you want to see the four and more symbol? Um, he was very proud of that symbol. Max had picked it for him at the Gretsch factory. I hit it, looked at it, studied it, all the things a fan would do. It was tarnished, almost black, and it had a crack in it, but it had that same sound. It had a smaller bell than most of the Ks have now. Matter of fact, all his symbols had small bells, almost like a mini cup. The crashes were mediums and medium thins. The sock symbols were heavy. I took a thin 15 inch, but the others were heavy. The ride had a pretty sound, pretty and dark, with a crystal character to the stick sound. When Zildjian describes Ks, they describe them as dark and trashy, but you had some with a pretty sound. Tony had both the pretty sound and the dark sound. Um, mm. I love the way he describes the sound of these things because it's it's similar. Well, it's basically the same as Tony described it, the high and yeah. the dark sound simultaneously. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing to think of him, you know, being able to pick these, these symbols. Um, when, when he talks about the smaller bells, I wonder if he's, you know, the photos that we've looked at, um, I don't feel like Tony's symbols have a particularly small looking bells. Um, of but the era maybe. Right. Maybe well, because he's, in the, to... he's talking about the nineties, you know, Zilchin, at that time were making symbols, particularly their K's at the time did have larger bells than yeah. old K's tended to have. Um, but a mini bell is really sort of another thing. And well, I don't know, maybe some of these symbols did have mini bells, but um, so what we want to focus on is those three 22 inch rides that Wallace um, is given by Tony Williams. Um, so he Ended up loaning. So Wallace was very, very good friends with the great drummer Lenny White. And again, please look up Lenny White if you don't know who this guy is. He's a legend. Yeah. He's an amazing drummer. Also played with Miles Davis, has played with so many of the jazz greats, and he's a really, really, really marvelous drummer. And I, I love him very much. And um, Wallace and Lenny were very, very close. And uh, Lenny played in Wallace's band a lot in the uh, in the '90s, and I remember going to see Wallace at the Village Vanguard with Lenny playing drums, and mm. it really blew my mind. I still remember it as being a a real, you know, one of the best gigs that I remember seeing. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and I think at the time Lenny was probably playing one of those old K's. I didn't know it at the time, but um, Wallace had loaned Lenny one of those twenty twos. And um, Wallace says elsewhere in this interview from Modern Drummer, he says, Tony's cymbals were not thin. They were all medium heavy. I would venture to say that the one he played on four and more was heavier than medium heavy. I mean, you always have to worry about articulating anyway, but I could definitely hear the stick. Not just stick, but beautiful warm undertones underneath. Lenny thinks the one I loaned him is the one on Nefertiti. It looks like that one on a video with rivet holes and it's medium heavy too. Hmm. So he's talking about the symbol he loaned Lenny and Lenny apparently um, thinks that that symbol is the one on Nefertiti. It looks like that one on a video with rivet holes. So 
I wanted to kind of find out more about that, you know, sort of that identification yeah. process. Now, there's an interview with Lenny um, in Modern Drummer, July 2008. We have an interview with Lenny White, also done by Bruce Whitted, the same gentleman who interviewed Wallace. Um, and Bruce knows all of the right questions to ask. Bruce is a good drummer himself and, and always mm -hmm. asks the guys the right questions. So he's talking about the Nefertiti ride. Um, that Wallace loaned him. Wallace has a bunch, this is Lenny speaking. Wallace has a bunch of Tony symbols and that one sticks out. I played it for a long time. Wallace and I deduced that it was the symbol Tony used on Nefertiti. If you go to YouTube and see videos of the 60s tours, it's the symbol that has the rivet holes. So presumably we're talking about the Miles Davis band, the 60s tours. Um, sure. So um, there are three videos of, well, actually, sorry, there are four videos um, that you can see of the Miles Davis quintet with Tony Williams playing in the 60s. Um, the first is from the Steve Allen show and in September 64, and the next is from Milan, Italy in October 1964. Um, and on both of those, Tony is playing his own drums, and he is not using a symbol. He's using this, what I think is the same symbol we've seen in these pictures, um, but yeah. it's, it doesn't have rivet holes. So it's the one that the, the, the classic Max Roach given. I th we think up. so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it doesn't have the cracks yet, but um, not yet. Not yet. And yeah. then the next, vi the next videos, the only other videos that you can see on YouTube um, are from the 1967 European tour, which we talked about in the previous interview. That's the tour where Tony was not allowed to bring any of his own gear. And yeah. all of the photos that we see from that tour, virtually every night he's using different drums and different cymbals. Um, yeah. This is where he talked about he's using Don Lamont's kit. He's using Hollywood drums on some of the Italian dates. He's using different Ludwig drums. There's a video from Germany where he's playing premier drums and we think maybe Stambul symbols, but mm. no rivets in the ride or the crash. Um, it, the, the Stockholm video uh, from 1967 does have a ride with rivets. And um, we can look at some photos of that. Again, we talked about this in, the, um, in part two, but I'm pretty sure this is an A. And because I, of the, the lack of hammer hand hammer definition that you would normally see. Yeah. On a K. Yeah. You know that, but more for me, it's more the shape of the bell. It's a mm. little bit of a pyramid shaped bell with a flat top. Um, and if we put these together, this is, this is the Nefertiti symbol. This is, this is Wallace's, you know, K that Tony gave him that. That looks you know, different to me. Well, you know, it has rivet holes. It has roughly the same amount of rivet holes. Although to me, if I'm really getting anal, they look like they're spaced a little bit differently. Um, but mostly I think the bell looks pretty different and the lathing looks pretty different. You see deeper lathing, deeper tonal grooves on the Nefertiti ride. Yeah. And, 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 and this ride from Stockholm um, does it, I mean, it has some tonal grooves, but they're not as deep basically. Um, now, that this is not to say that that's not the, the symbol that you hear on Nefertiti, but the tune Nefertiti specifically was recorded on June 7th, 1967 in New York. And this, this gig um, in Stockholm is actually October 31st, 1967. So a few months later, here's an important fact about the Nefertiti ride. I have never played it. I've never seen it in person and I've never played it. It was at the Zildjian factory for a long time where they were sort of studying it. Um, but it's back with Wallace's family now. Um, I know um, two drummers um, very well who have both played the Nefertiti ride. And um, that would be Bill Stewart and John Riley, who are both um, amazing drummers, and I've been lucky to take lessons from both of them. Uh, mm. And both of them have told me that they've played this symbol, and they were positive without a doubt that it was the symbol on Nefertiti because it sounds oh, exactly to them like that symbol. It's that sound. Mm. Um, now, it's possible Tony had a whole bunch of 22-inch old Ks that all kind of sounded like that, which, I mean, you know, 
I've been looking for an old K that sounds like that for a long time, and I haven't quite found one. I have some Tony really, took them, he took them all. He took them all, <laughs> apparently, yeah. I, I have some really good old Ks, um, but nothing that really sounds quite like that. Um, I have heard some that have some of those elements, but I don't know. I mean, you know, B- Bill and John both said, you know, oh, yeah, that's got to be the symbol. It really has that yeah. sound. And maybe Tony They're, had yeah. a bunch of symbols in rotation. Maybe he took different ones to recording sessions. My only argument is that I don't think unless we have some, you know, it doesn't sound from Wallace's interview in 99. It doesn't sound the way he describes the experience of getting those symbols from Tony. It doesn't sound like Tony confirmed to him oh yeah this was the symbol i used on nefertiti he did identify no. the foreign more symbol but um he didn't specify oh yeah this one you're taking is you know i use that on nefertiti there seemed to be a little less uh what's the word i'm looking for like uh like holding that one and for himself like in high praise of like i'm gonna this is my baby where where the max wrote when he was a, yeah. a kid yeah yeah i don't know just to let it go like that it makes you wonder but maybe for him it was just another session yeah, I don't. I yeah. I mean, they they literally went in and recorded. You know, that day, uh, June seventh, they recorded the tune "Water Babies" and the tune "Nefertiti." Um, a week or so later, they recorded a couple more. And I mean, that that there was there were four dates where they recorded "Nefertiti," and they did like hmm. you know two one or two tunes per day. And you know, they were going to the studio all the time and recording. And Tony probably never knew what they were going to do from from day to day. So. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe he just brought in a different symbol that day. I mean, there, we can only speculate, but I, I do, you know, I, I, I don't think that it's really been positively confirmed other than people using their ears, which is certainly very important. Um, but otherwise, it hasn't exactly been, you know, like identified as for sure being yeah. the Nefertiti symbol. Um, but that hasn't stopped a lot of other, you know, symbol manufacturers from making copies of it. And, um, you know, well, for, for example, Lenny White um, is a uh, Istanbul Agap artist and Istanbul took uh, the old K, the Nefertiti symbol for a while and made a copy of it. And then ultimately a variation on it with a bit of a smaller bell, which became Lenny's signature symbol, which is the um, epoch ride, which is a mm-hmm. lovely symbol. When I was with Istanbul Agap, I had a couple of those and I used to love playing them. Nice, um, yeah. A lot of uh, independent symbol manufacturers um, make a Nefertiti ride um, that is based on kind of what they, what, what I guess what they speculate this, um, symbol from Wallace, you know, the weight and the profile and things like that. But the important thing is, is that people love Tony and people love the album Nefertiti and to- the way Tony plays on that album and particularly that track is is legendary. And all yeah. of this talk about the symbol keeps that legacy going. It keeps people interested in it. It keeps people checking out. I think if there wasn't so much talk about the Nefertiti ride, maybe not so many drummers who weren't otherwise jazz enthusiasts, maybe they wouldn't have gone and checked out Tony on Nefertiti. Totally. And I totally. think it's what what's really important is that more and more people are. And that's, I think that's great. <laughs> Um, Agreed. But, so, but as you said, that was just like a couple days at a session. It's yeah. iconic, but where let's move forward there from like, I mean, that would put us what at about 69 and well, one 60, with Tony's 68 is yeah. a transitional period. This is when Miles's group starts to go electric. The music starts changing. There starts to be more straight eighth note grooves. And um, using my ears, as we talked about, um, the last recording that I hear the classic Tony old K sound, whether it is the Nefertiti symbol or whether it's the earlier foreign more symbol that's cracked, we don't know, but that sound, the sound that I hear, you know, on, on those early recordings, the last recording that I personally hear it on is on, um, field of Kilimanjaro, mm. which was recorded in later 1968. Well, the first half of the record was done in June 68. And then was finished up um, in September, September 24th of 1968. And that's the last time that I hear it. The next time they record is November 11th, 1968. And they go in and do some stuff that wasn't actually released until years later. But they do a tune called Two-Faced, 
a tune called Dual Mr. Anthony Tillman Williams Process. It's a very weird title. Yeah. Um, and and then Splash, Splash Down, come a couple of days later. Um, it's great music, but I hear a different ride altogether on that music, mm. starting with Two-Faced. I, I, I hear a cleaner, it's still maybe a K, but it's a cleaner sound. I don't hear ah kind of stuff, you know, that sure. swirly kind of cool trash, bit of trashiness. And, it, and the stick is maybe a little bit more, I don't want to say metallic, but maybe slightly, slightly towards pingier rather than woodier. And yep, gotcha. this photo that we've looked at in our previous episodes um, from San Francisco in 1968, um, this this photo was was listed on Getty Images as being from from 1968 at the both and. And according to my timeline here, they played at the both and in October of uh, 1968, October 8th to 20th, 1968. And also, interestingly, this would be. Um, around the time that Mike Clark talks about having first seen Tony, um, Mike Clark, I believe grew up in the Bay area yep. or at least was in the Bay area at this point and, um, went to see Tony and he actually, there's a great interview with, with Mike Clark, again, another drummer that everybody should go check out. If you're not familiar with him, another legend, an amazing drummer, very influenced by Tony. Um, and, there's a great interview with Mike Clark specifically where he talks about Tony talks about his experiences, seeing Tony and knowing Tony. And he talks about seeing him for the first time at the both and in 1968. And he talks about seeing Tony and that Tony had a second ride symbol down kind of by his hi hat and that he was doing mm. all of this fancy stuff where he kind of cross over and play this second ride. And amazingly in this photo that I found, you can actually see a second symbol over by his with hi-hat. We see his yeah, regular 22, rivets, his like. 18. Yes, exactly. It looks like a symbol with rivets over on his left. So this completely is you know, consistent with my, what Mike's talking about. But what we also see here, um, besides the really nifty clothes that everybody's suddenly wearing, they, yeah. they it seems like <laughs> they threw away all of their suits and uh, yeah. got some really cool... Um, got some really cool clothes and this symbol that we see Tony playing is a different symbol. It's, it's, it's way less patinaed. Um, there are no cracks. This seems to be a new symbol. It seems like he finally retired the, uh, the symbol with, uh, presumably with the chunk taken out and then starts using this symbol. And mm, I don't yeah. know what this is. This could be an A, it could be a K, it could be a Peisty 602 for all I know. But, um, it does to, on those recordings from this era. To me, it sounds a bit like maybe a heavier old K, but that's complete speculation. We just really don't sure. know. Um, I think he may be using the same symbol with Lifetime in 1969. Um, you know, again, we see in these photos from Monterey in 1969 um, a uh, sort of a cleaner symbol. Um, this may be a 602. I just don't know. Um, I, anybody who knows Peisty better than I do, cause I'm not anywhere near a Peisty expert. Like some people are, if you want to say in the comments, tell us if you think that might be a 602. Um, if we look at this other photo from Monterey, um, we can see, um, Tony still using the same symbol on the left though. We see that a with that, that grungy piece of tape underneath it. Um, so yeah, we get into 1970 and these may be new symbols altogether. That looks like a very new symbol. It almost looks like an A Zildjian to me. I just, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's just not enough photos and not enough detail here to really be able to tell. But it's certainly a new-ish symbol or maybe an older yeah. symbol that he cleaned. It also looks, and we're looking at Newport from 1970. Um, it looks like possibly that's a different left symbol for the first time because it looks cleaner and I don't see that distinctive piece of tape um, sure. on it. But once we get into um, 71, we see that old A pop up again on the left. Um, same thing with uh, the photos from New York City in 1970. You know, it's some sort of cleaner symbol. Again, I think this looks like an A to me, but just can't really be sure. It could be, it, it could be a K. 
you know, it could be just sort of a clean old K without very deep hammering. Um, we get to 71. Again, looking at these photos from Copenhagen, this I think is an altogether new symbol. And I do think this symbol is a 602. This is what it looks like to me. But again, please, 602 experts, come at me. Tell me what this is. Do you think this is a 602? Do you think it's something else? Is it an A? I don't know. I'm sorry I don't have more definitive answers, but there's there's no like Tony, you know, there's no interview with Tony where he talks about his gear at any point, you know. The first interview I ever found where he talks a little bit about his gear, he gives a rundown of his drum sizes in his uh I think it's April 1978 Modern Drum. No, it's January 1978 Modern Drummer interview. Um he runs down his drum sizes. Um, and he says, I use K Zildjian symbols, but beyond that, he doesn't give any symbol sizes. So that's, hmm. you know, we don't have interviews like we have now where, you know, you get a big gear list and, yep. you know, there's nothing a, like a that layout for Tony. With pictures. And, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah we yeah. don't get that in this era, but you know, again, this photo from 71 and Copenhagen from the side, we can see, you know, I'm pretty sure that's the same old 18 inch a, I we can't really see them, but I, I, you know, in 72 and 73, he's still using those old K hi-hats that he's had since the beginning of his career. Um, I think those stuck around. Um, now, things do get a little squirrely when we get into 72 because he starts experimenting with some different things. Um, and we have video and photos from 1972 where he suddenly has a 20, it looks like a 20 inch zildjian swish a chinese symbol um a chinese yeah. style symbol on his left to replace briefly to replace that 18 um and it's a it's a swish with rivets and you know he uses it quite a bit on this video from 72 um it's a pretty cool sounding symbol actually this other photo i have from 72 though he doesn't have it on the left yeah. Uh, in this one, so he tries. He, to, he yeah, tries and, it's it's yeah. an experiment. Um, we do have this different ride symbol again. I think this is another yet another ride. Um, he really doesn't seem to have settled on a ride, or maybe he keeps breaking them and retiring them. But this is a mm. shinier ride. It looks like maybe a brilliant finish. It could be an A with a brilliant finish, or it could be again. I've seen some six o twos that look a little bit like this like pre-serial number era 602s that can be kind of glossy like this. But again, on this 72 photo, we see the, uh, the, the same A, you see that strip of tape, and it looks like the same grungy old K Zildjians. There's another symbol that pops up in this photo with Stan Getz um, from 72. And again, the old A, I see that strip of tape on, the, on his left, but then we have a smaller symbol with six rivets and it's it it's a smaller symbol and it also has a very small bell and i've wondered if yeah. this it now it's possible that this is actually that chinese symbol because i see sort of another one of those it could be a, a sure lathing you know a tonal groove because there's another big one kind of in the center there but it yeah. could also be the sort of lip of the china where the edge turns up maybe that's that same a swish and he just put it over as his main ride interestingly we also see another symbol stand to the far right of that but unfortunately oh, yeah. stan gets his uh saxophone is in the way and and we can't tell what that what that is yeah and again to continue the mystery um when we get to 73 and he does his tony williams in africa film um which we talked about those drums a little bit uh this is a bizarre, this is, I, this could be that same symbol we see in 72 because it's another sort of shiny symbol. And I originally thought when I saw this first photo, um, that that was another Peisty 2002 logo, but looking at some other clips, I now actually think that could just be some sort of sticker or something because it doesn't actually look like the 2002 logo. It's, it, I don't know. It's like... Yeah. Again, Peisty nerds, tell me what you think this could be. Dan Garza did the Peist, multiple Peisty episodes mm. with me, so I'd love for him to chime in. But Garrison spoke to these a little bit, and if I remember correctly, mm. I mean, it was a few days ago, but he said 
he said those are Pisces. He he, uh, uh, he said just looking at the logo and the, yeah. But I think he he was not speaking from a hundred percent like right. you know look at the badge. This it was more just looking at it. His gut said Pisces. So well, the, I, you know I don't know. The symbol on Tony's left is definitely a Pisces. We see the Pisces two thousand two logo. We see on the other side of the bell it says Crash. That's that's classic. You know Pisces two thousand two. And it's possible that's the same two thousand two that he got in Montro the year before yeah. that we talked about when he's playing with Steve the Gad. Gad's kit. Exactly. Yeah. It could be this exact same Crash. This is an area where I have done less research than on the stuff from the 60s. Um, This era is really, there's just not much documented. Um, I can tell you, I'm pretty sure that he's using, still using his old K-14s that he's used all through the 60s and into the early 70s. Those look like the same symbols, but, you know, otherwise, I just can't. I, I just don't know. Um, things do yep. get much more standardized by the time we get into 75. Um, just as the kit itself, the drums get very standardized. In fact, into the setup that he would use for the rest of his career, pretty much. The big 13, 14, 14, 16, 18, 24. Around the same time that we get into that, we also get into a, a new simple setup that he sticks with basically for the rest of his career which is old K's um, still, these are still old K's made in Istanbul, but he expands the sizes. He adds a couple more and he also changes the size of the hi-hats. Now, of course, again, we, we can't really see them because of the cool smoke in this photo yeah. from the back cover of Believe It. But um, he does at this time start using 15 inch hi-hats. Um, he keeps the 18 on his left, the 22 on his right, but he adds a smaller crash in the middle. Now, by the time he gets into the 80s, when he's a Zildjian endorser, he's using a 15-inch crash. But in this era, in the 70s, it may be a 15, it may be a 16. He may have had a couple different ones. I'm not exactly sure what the size is. I've always kind of assumed it was always a 15, but that would be a little bit of a harder size to find. I mean, he has 15 inch hi hats, so maybe it wouldn't yeah. be. But um, yeah, I do yeah, know yeah. The, the far right symbol beyond the ride is a 20, a 20 inch crash. And um, similar to what I said before, he, you know, 99.9% of the time he rides only on the ride symbol. But occasionally, I hear it on a few points, I think on the. Um, great jazz trio at the village vanguard recordings he does occasionally ride on the left side symbol on the 18 but very very yeah. very rarely most of his most of the ride action is done here on the 22 um so that is the setup that he stays with more or less through his whole career um they are old k's through the 70s and um you know, K's were still made in Turkey. Um, at a certain point, um, the K Zildjian company, uh, the factory closed down in 1977, I believe. Yeah. I uh, think so. and K's then started being made in the Meductic New Brunswick factory in Canada that would eventually become the Sabian factory. But at that time it was still owned by Zildjian and they started making K's hand hammered in Canada, and these are referred to, they were only made for a few years, but they're referred to as Canadian K's. And there are a number of photos of Tony in the early 80s where he's playing Canadian K's. And the way that you can tell is that Canadian K's have this distinctive K logo underneath the uh, the symbol, yeah, on the bottom of the symbol. And this K, this, this particular K logo was actually revived Years later, when they when they introduced the Karope line, that was the K that they used for the Karopes, the same, you know, the same logo. And you see Tony, you know, in this photo with a, with an 18 with the with the Canadian K logo. You can see him here with a with the 22 with the K, Canadian K logo. Interestingly, in this Gretsch ad, if you zoom in on the the little symbol in the middle, you can actually see that that's an American made. Zildjian and A um, with that sort of classic 70s hollow logo um, yes. on the bottom. So that's an interesting thing. 
And yeah, there's other photos here. You can see where Tony's playing Canadian K's. But in 1982, 83 is when Zildjian in America started to develop their own version of the K. And collectors refer to this as early American K's or EA K's, um, meaning these are the first run or first version of K's that they made in the Norwell, Massachusetts plant. And they were... Um, at least somewhat hand hammered in these days. Um, they would eventually go to entirely machine hammering where they used a computer program to replicate hand hammering. But initially they, they were hand hammered and Tony was, you know, sort of the, well, literally the poster boy here as we see yeah. Yeah, in yeah, his yeah. awesome green jumpsuit for the <laughs> new American made K's. And by this point, this is basically what he starts using um, exclusively, you just see him using American made K's as f I'm pretty sure from this point forward, except that we do see some photos and some video where he's playing what to me look exactly like American made K's, but they have no logos on them. And I've wondered if Prototypes maybe, or... yeah, that's exactly it. I've wondered if Zildjian gave him some prototypes to try out. And he liked them so much that they didn't have logos on them, but he liked them so much he continued to use them even after, you know, for a couple of years after. In fact, ironically, there's a Zildjian Day video. This was a series of clinics put on by Zildjian from, I think, Dallas in 1985, where Tony does a clinic and he's playing EAKs, but they have no logos. And it's actually a clinic sponsored by Zildjian. <laughs> and he has symbols that don't He's appear like, to say Zildjian on them anywhere. Yeah, try and stop him. <laughs> Only Tony could get away with that. I love it. But certainly by this great photo in 1990, these are, you know, made yeah. in made in America K's. And, and again, to, to reiterate the sizes, 15-inch high hats. Um, now, an interesting tidbit about the hats, um, he... Sometimes I think would use regular 15 inch high hats, but also at times would use two bottom high hats. Um, this is something that um, different people have confirmed. And there's actually a video from Germany, um, I think around 88, where you can see the logo. Um, and I think he might actually be using A's oddly for some reason mm. instead of his usual K's, but you can actually see the top symbol says bottom hi-hat on it. So you would actually get two bottoms because he liked, you know, the bottom symbols heavier. He liked heavy, sure. heavy hi-hats. Um, left symbol is an 18 inch K Zildjian dark crash. Middle symbol is a 15 inch dark crash. The ride is a 22 inch ride. It's not a heavy ride or a jazz ride or any of the different models, just the just ride, 22 inch ride. And mm. then on the far right is a 20 inch dark crash. And that's his setup basically until we get to the era that Garrison covered, um, where yeah. he did switch to a customs and I believe Garrison covered all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if you're, if people are listening to this out of sequence and going, Oh, I want to listen to the symbols of Tony Williams. Part three was with, uh, his, his drum tech, from about 94 till 97 when, you know, the end of his life. Um, and Garrison touched on that and uh, the A customs and stuff. And, yeah. and there was just a lot of stories in that one. So go check that one out yeah. to pick up all the information from drums, cymbals, everything uh, up to the the end of the unfortunate end of Tony's life. Yeah. But um, he did experiment a lot and he did add some A customs, but but he was never like. Like I remember, like um, who was it? Vinny Kalayuda would be like, you'd see the old video, the old VHS tape, and it'd be like, he's all a customs now, yeah, or he's all Paiste. With Tony, it's like, no, no, no. There's a K. There's an A custom. There's my, you know, nineteen whatever fifty nine K hi hats. He'd mix and match. So yeah, he was he yeah. was always experimenting, and he was really interested in what drummers were doing what other drummers that he liked were doing you know he was always checking out new music and finding new music and new drummers that excited him and he wanted to yeah. experiment and try some of these new things a customs were the new thing they were all the rage and and that's what drummers that he liked were using so he wanted to try yeah. them and i love that yeah and we don't need to, we to don't grow. need to get into it because garrison talked about it but really the like hearing um uh, like Lars and wanting to try those symbols and, and just really yeah. ex the experimentation is, is crazy and something you uh, you don't think about but 
as we get closer to where it seems like we're getting closer to the end of the symbols, should we talk about the Istanbul Mehmet yeah, situation? I, yeah, yeah. So um, in the mid, uh, I guess, uh, 2016, 2017, um, Tony's uh, widow, Colleen, um, approached the Istanbul Mehmet company to make a replica set of Tony's symbols. And this is where we finally actually see some, some photos of these symbols from the 60s. Again, having not really seen them, I mean, we see the maybe the hi hat and the left symbol in some of the photos from the 70s, as I mentioned. But, you know, basically we haven't seen or heard from these symbols. She actually went to the factory in Turkey and took those symbols herself, um, hand delivered them to them to replicate. And there's some amazing photos of these symbols from, um, uh, that, that were put out, you know, by Istanbul Mehmet on, you know, various social media and other sort of promotion platforms. Um, there's a photo of a gentleman. I'm, I, I apologize. I'm probably going to butcher your name. Um, Bulent Akbe, who is a great drummer in, in Turkey who works for Istanbul Mehmet. And there's a photo of him posing with the symbols. So these are Tony's old K heavy hi hats that we talked about. The 18 inch A, and you can really see some nice detail of that typical A machine hammering. Um, although actually, sorry, A's in the 50s were also hand hammered a bit. Mm. So um, it may be a mixture. And then the old K. Um, now they've kind of hidden the crack. We're going to see that in some other photos. But I did a lot of, you know, I spent a lot of time comparing the photos of some of those early photos from the Copenhagen concert and also that photo from Seattle. And man, I mean, this looks like the exact same symbol. You remember I pointed yeah. out that um, very thick tonal groove about two inches from the edge. Yes. You yes. see that here. Um, let's see. There's the, there's the entire, um, the, the team with these symbols. Um, so this is um, on the left is Colin Schofield, who used to work for Zildjian. Um, who I believe was the one who introduced Colleen to the, the folks at Mamet. Um, that is Colleen holding the one of the hi-hats. There is um, Mamet himself, the founder of the company, who used to work at the old K factory in the 60s and 70s. And um, Bulent, again, um, posing with the symbols. And then they put out a lot of great literature, all these ads that showed amazing photos of the original symbols. If you look at Mamet ad one, this is some great detail. And you see the black and white photos of the um, gentleman at the factory measuring these symbols and 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 sort of making the, the modern equivalent to them. But yeah. the main, you know, what we're really looking at is, is you know, the, the symbols as they look today. So you can see, if we go back to some of those photos from the 60s, like I showed you that one from 1968 where he's got almost the sort of top corner of the symbol lopped off the top. You can see it matches, it yeah. matches really, really well. I mean, it's I'm almost positive this is the exact same symbol we see in those photos. We can sure. also see that the symbol has quite a keyhole in the bell and that he yeah. actually has put a little grommet in the middle to try to keep the symbol centered. Um, you can see sort of it's, it's hidden by the hi-hats, but you can see that same area of wear that I pointed out where the symbol, you can see where the symbol was probably played most of the time. Yeah. Um, so what else do we see here? We see the hi-hats um, and we see in the A, the left symbol, again, you see that detail of a very typical looking 50s A to, to, to my eyes. And you can see a pretty substantial crack in the body of the symbol, sort of on the on the right side of the symbol, just to the right of the bell. Yeah. You can see a pretty nasty crack in the surface there. If we look at this sort of montage I did of three photos where you can see Tony's symbol in the 60s, where you can see that um, tonal, uh, the, the, the tonal groove I've been talking about that's kind of distinctive about an inch in from the edge. And we can see this photo from the Istanbul Mehmet factory of the symbols sort of, you know, as they were being replicated. You can see that exact same, about one inch, one and a half inches from the edge, yeah. the same tonal groove happening. Um, so that's a pretty, you know, clear identifier that this does seem to, in fact, be that same symbol. How were these received? I mean, were these were these well received as being a good replica in the in the community? 
Um, I think a little bit mixed, to be honest. I, I heard okay. them at Nam, um, and I thought that the 18 and the hi hats were really, really good replicas. They sounded to me like the 18 had that quickness um, and sort of sensitivity that his symbols seem to have. The hi hats were a nice yeah. sort of chunky weight and had that same sort of definition. Um, but the thing about the ride is that with that big chunk taken out of it, I think the sound of the ride may have changed. Although Wallace said that it still had that sure. vibe in in the interview yeah. with Wallace, you know, he said that, he, that it still had that sound, but also that would deaden the symbol a little bit and maybe change the yeah. overtones. The, the the Tony Williams 22 Mamet is a great sounding symbol, but it's it doesn't quite have the same breathy kind of <sighs> those kind of overtones, right? That we associate. Yeah, you're copying. And you're copying something that's been, it's not the same as it was when it didn't have a gigantic, like you said, 5% of it is missing. So that's a tough thing to do. But again, just getting these photos is yeah, unbelievable. It is. And it the is. Access to it. Now, yeah. one thing I wanted to, this is, again, we're going to get a little bit into the weeds with the weights, but generally when a symbol company copies a symbol, besides measuring things like the height of the bell and other, you know, looking at the lathing, they're, they're going to record the weights. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to weigh these symbols to know exactly how thick or thin they were. Um, and while they've never published um, in all this literature, they didn't publish the actual weights of Tony's symbols, which I kind of wish they did. I also wish they would give us some detail on the stamps, but they never did that either. And you can't see mm. the stamps in any of these photos in any yep. sort of detail. But what I did do when these first came out, I looked at the first couple of years of, um, listings of these symbols on various retailers where they would list the weights of the symbols. So things like, um, oh, I forget the different dealerships, but, you know, different people would put them on eBay or wherever and they would list the weights. And I collected the weights of a whole bunch of, of, of this, this set, the 22, the 18, and the top and bottom hi hats. And the 22s, um, Basically, I don't really have them in order, do I? No, the, the thinnest one I found was 2233, and the heaviest I found was 2330. So that's a that's a range of about 100 grams on the 20, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. the 22. With the median, I, I, I should have done the actual mathematic calculations, but that would put them kind of like the average, maybe like 22 uh 80 2290 some something in that range now sure. granted this symbol was missing you know like i said about five percent of its of its body so, yeah, so that would change it, it may have originally been a little heavier but we could kind of guess that tony's actual foreign more ride based on these weights that the mamet copies were i could make an assumption that the original symbol was somewhere in that just slightly under 2300 range, maybe 2280 to 2290, somewhere in there. Um, which to me, it's that's possible. I mean, I a lot of people insist that the foreign more symbol is a heavy symbol and that the Nefertiti ride or any of these recordings are a heavier symbol. And it may well be, but I've also played old K's and modern hand hammered symbols that are in that 20, you know, high 2200, low 2300 range that play a lot like Tony's symbol. So yeah. interesting. It, it's, it's all speculative, but this is some evidence that may point to a weight range. Um, now the 18s um, that I recorded, the weights were between 1250 and 1299. So that's a, 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 shallower not a wider but a shallower range of weights a smaller range of weights with the median i guess being somewhere in the 1275 range so yeah. we could guess that tony's left symbol the 18 may have been about 1275 grams um the hi-hat tops ranged between 975 and 997 again not a big weight range so we could guess that the top was probably maybe around 985 ish um, the bottom ranges are between 1143 and 1163. So we could guess maybe around 1152, 1153 for the bottom, which again wow. is a little bit on the heavier side for jazz hi-hats, certainly not on the heavy side compared to like a pair of Zildjian New Beats or something like that. But a lot of the Zildjian K-Constantinople pairs 
K Constantinople 14 inch hi hat pairs are around that sort of like nine and a half to 11 and a half range. Um, yeah. Which is interesting, interesting that they kind of yeah. came to that pairing, maybe separate from actually weighing Tony's symbols. But those are the weight mm. ranges that I found. Those may be of interest to some people, but that's kind of the yeah. averages that I found that those Mamet signature symbols were um, were, were were coming in at. So yeah, um, well, I mean, if you're an hour and forty five minutes or two hours into this, you're probably <laughs> interested in the the gram weights of, you, of the symbols. Yeah, you're probably a big <laughs> enough nerd. Sorry, it took us so long yeah. to get to that. Um, <laughs> speaking of the time, I do want to talk a little bit about the sticks and the heads before we run out of time. Yeah, so, let's do it. Let's jump over to sticks and heads. You pick yeah. you want whatever you want to do first and then we'll let's we'll close out this uh you know the series let's talk about sticks um i mean i can say that until he switched to the big kit meaning until 75 um it's just coated heads top and bottom on all of the drums without really any changes um obviously the bottom snare head would be a clear snare head but yeah. um i've but they're never plastic. found they're, they're yeah they're, i've never found not- any not calf. I've never found any evidence of him using calf. Um, all of the photos where you can see um, the heads, you can see, you know, a lot of wear on the heads and you can see that distinctive sort of like spot in the middle where the coating starts to wear away and you can actually sort of see the clear plastic underneath the yeah. coating. Um, that's visible in a number of photos. His his childhood radio kings were probably calfskin heads. Yes. I would it'd be fair yeah. to say, but yeah, we're talking- yeah, that, right, right, and that's that would you know that photo probably dates from before the plastic head was really invented, or certainly yeah. before it was commonplace. Um, but when yep. we're talking about his professional career and certainly his recording career, where we have photos of him, um, we're talking about plastic heads. Now, what I don't know is how often or not he was using. Um, Remo coated ambassadors or Remo coated heads, or whether he's using Gretsch permatone coated heads most of the time. Um, it's even possible maybe he had some Evans heads, those existed then. But mm-hmm. I do know I have w- this one photo from 1964, February, uh, at the recording session for Eric Dolphy's Out to Lunch. If you zoom in really close, you can just make out what I'm pretty sure is a Gretsch permatone logo. Just under his mm-hmm. left hand there. Were, were those white labeled like Remo heads, you think? Certainly now, and, and I think probably at least since the 80s, they were made for Gretsch by Remo. Possibly to slightly different specs. I think they might have a slightly different counter hoop. Um, but more or less the same as um, Remo heads. Um, but in the 60s, they may have been made by Evans for them, or they may have been made by Remo or somebody else. I don't know. I I don't think the Gretsch factory made them on site, but it's possible. I don't know. Somebody comment, please tell us about Gretsch permatone heads and who made them for, for Gretsch. I would love Got to it. know. Yeah. Now, Famously, when we get to the big kit era, starting in 75, 76, um, this photo that I showed you from the Keystone Corner in 1975 is the first time we see the uh, famous Remo CS black dot heads, which Tony became really known for using. CS stands for controlled sound for anybody who doesn't know. And it's a clear head, basically an ambassador weight head with a black dot. Um, which is sort of a reinforcement. It, it acts as both a reinforcement, like it sort of protects the head, and it also mutes the head a little bit. It's just a little bit of tone control to take off some of the highs, and that's why they call it controlled sound. And Tony apparently just fell in love with this head because he yeah. put them top and bottom on all of his drums, except and kick. Well, yeah, on the on the on the twenty four inch bass drum, the except the front yeah. head, he has a clear yeah. Remo head on the front. Um, and you can see this photo from 76. He's got some tape on the top of the front head. Um, uh, but otherwise, it's all black dots um, all through the 80s, except for one very interesting little affair that he had with a very new, very short-lived and obscured, uh, obscure drumhead company called Compo, C-O-M-P-O. And this is an ad from Modern Drummer. Tony Williams, it's my latest new discovery, compo heads. And these are woven fiber heads. 
It's a completely different technology than Mylar, than what um, Remo and um, Evans and Aquarian use. Um, woven fiber, and I think the idea was that they sounded a little warmer and sounded maybe a bit more like calfskin. But Tony was briefly a Capo Heads endorser. And there are photos, and I got some screenshots from a tour he did in Europe in 1986 with Herbie Hancock and uh, Branford Marsalis on tenor sax and Buster Williams on bass. And he's got his regular yellow Gretsch kit. Now, these are not the best screenshots. I apologize. But he actually had Compo make him heads that were not only sort of black dot type heads or dot type heads, but they were actually black. The head was black and the dot was yellow matching his yellow kit. And mm. they are spectacular. Um, it's hard to see, but, but you can kind of make out that that's a, those are yellow dots. Now, oh, yeah. That this certain screenshot, picture looks yellow. Yeah, this screenshot, he does seem to still be using a regular Remo CS black dot on his snare. And maybe he was already, you know, kind of on the outs with Compo by this point. I'm <laughs> yeah. not sure. Um, they didn't last long on his kit, but they are on this, this whole tour. All of the, there's, there's a couple of videos. And everybody should watch them because the music's amazing. But it, he's also got these these really kind of strange heads um, on this tour. So black heads with a with a yellow dot. Um, so that's that's the drum heads. Um, I will add, and maybe I don't know if Garrison mentioned this, but when he switched to DW, um, not maybe not initially, but the 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 last time I saw Tony play was in uh, late 1996. He played a week at Birdland with a trio with Mulgrew Miller and Ron Carter. And I went a couple of nights and Tony had his big DW kit and he had the A Customs. He had the new set of A Customs. But on the snare drum, he had a coated head because um, he played a fair amount of brushes with that trio. And on that- Yeah, Garrison on that said, game, he said, I'm, he said, I'm putting a, I'm putting a coded ambassador uh, on this thing right now. Interesting. He said verbatim, he said, I'm yeah. going to be putting this on because you're doing a lot of brush work because Tony could make it sound good with a clear CS dot. But I think Garrison had a big uh, push for that to happen. That's amazing. That's great. That's great info. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that was Garrison's idea. I love it. Thank you, Garrison. Yeah, yeah. Tony yeah, sounded yeah. amazing. I mean, it was unbelievable to, to, to get to see him. I, I saw him, that's the only time I saw him play with a band. I saw him do clinics um, a couple of times, and then that was the only time I saw him with a band and it was uh it was pretty spectacular um so yeah, i want to cover absolutely. some 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 drumsticks um yeah totally before well, let me, let me i want to read this real quick actually yeah. really quick before we move on just because it's its own kind of history but i just quickly googled googled it and then ended up on drumforum.org which i love mm. uh the user the dfo veteran gutenberg said uh he's answering a question i do have some compo heads he says they're still in their boxes he said um Compo heads were produced by Asahi Chemical Cloth Japan in the 1980s wow. and were distributed in the U.S. by Kamen, K Kamen, K-A-M-A-N. Right. Tico Torres was an endorser. They were sort of a fabric weave, but not mesh. Some were similar to Kevlar, which are the ones I have, uh, which Gutenberg is saying, more suitable for marching. The drum kit ones had an N prefix for natural, I'm assuming. So a little bit of info on Compo. Fantastic. Thanks to User Gutenberg. Gutenberg on thank you, uh, Gutenberg. DFO. Yep. Yeah, and thanks, Drum <laughs> Forum. Uh, that's great info. That's really interesting. And in interesting that it was a Japanese com company distributed by uh, Kamen or Kaman, which would later go on to distribute Gretsch for a long time. Um, really? But I, okay. Yeah, actually, after Tony passed, um, I think in the late 90s, they, they took over um, distribution of Gretsch until DW later did. But all right, so drumsticks. Um, Tony is best known for using big sticks, particularly two Bs. Um, but um, and some people kind of assume that Tony used two Bs in the '60s as well, and that that's you know maybe part of his sound. But um, I have found absolutely no evidence that he was using two Bs until around it, '71 at the uh, at the um, earliest. Um, is, is the first photo that I've seen where he can be seen using two Bs. Now, this is another place where we get into a little bit of um, conflicting information because um, I'm going to refer to this interview with Wallace Roney again. 
Um, well, it's not conflicting information, just different information. So um, Wallace in February of 99, modern drummer, um, is talking about how big an influence Max Roach was on Tony Williams. Um, he says uh, he liked everything about Max, and he said that during the period of four and more, he was trying to tune his drums like Max. The sticks he was playing at the time were the Gretsch Max Roach model all through the Miles period. Hmm. So um, interesting that he mentions the Gretsch Max Roach model because um, I – in all of my research, have never been able to find any other information about the Gretsch Max Roach model, um, but Wallace refers to it a couple other times, and and um, Lenny White also had made well, he didn't make mention of it, but um, I mentioned that John Riley had played the Nefertiti symbol. He had he had actually heard he John told me this story. He heard Lenny White play that symbol with Wallace and was blown away by how that symbol sounded. And he talked to Lenny about it and Lenny told him he was playing it with a Gretsch Max Roach model stick. Um, now um, Wallace all right so we're gonna jump ahead a little bit. Um, Chris Bennett okay. who owns Bopworks was talking about a, a later stick that we'll get to in a second on Facebook about this, this later sort of variant of a five a that Tony was using in the early seventies. And when Wallace was still with us, uh, Wallace commented on, um, this Facebook post that Chris Bennett made. And, um, Wallace says, this is now five years ago, um, that Wallace made this comment. Wallace says, well, guys, here's what it is. In 1963 until 1971, Tony was using the Gretsch Max Roach stick. It was a 5D, not a 3D. Tony told me this himself. I have never seen a Max Roach stick, and I believe around 1965, Max asked them to take his name off. They were still called the Gretsch 5D. Okay, so then he goes on to talk about this later stick. but So he mentions the, the Max Roach 5D. D, D for dog. And um, again, I've never seen any any reference to a Max Roach 5D. Now, it's possible that Gretsch made that stick just for Max and never put it on the market. And maybe Max didn't want them to put a stick with his name on the market. We don't, we don't know. Um, I've never found anything about that. But the 5D was a model that Gretsch made, um, and it was in the Gretsch catalog. I'm going to refer to my notes starting in 1963. So before that, in the 1961 Gretsch catalog, we have a 1D, which is the Art Blakey model, 2D, Charlie Persip, 3D, Sonny Payne, 4D, Louis Belson. And then we jump to 7D, Mel Lewis, and 8D, Don Lamond. So there was no 5D. Hmm. Um, but in six, well, yeah. in 63, we do have a 5D, but it's called the Philly Joe Jones model stick. So this is very interesting. Gotcha. So it is a, there, that, that was a model that Gretsch made. Um, now, interestingly, by the 1966 catalog, it's no longer the Philly Joe Jones model stick. It's called the 5D progressive jazz stick. So they took Philly Joe's name off of it for whatever reason. Um, now it's possible that maybe Philly Joe had moved. Philly Joe became a premier drum endorser. Um, certainly by the late sixties, he was a premier artist. So maybe he had mm -hmm. left Gretsch by 66 and they took his name off the stick, but they still produced yeah. it. So that was a stick that existed. And maybe that's a stick that Tony used, but I have seen photographic evidence that Tony was using at least in the early sixties in 63, 64, now, I'm going to show you a photo um, from the November 1963 session for Gratian Mansour's Evolution record, which is an amazing record. And this is a photo where you can just kind of make out some writing on Tony's left stick. Now, I'm, I've been lucky enough to see a high, sort of a high-res version of this that unfortunately I don't have my own copy of. But at the Mosaic Records warehouse in Connecticut, which is now sadly closed, they 
took a number of these negatives and made large prints of them, including this photo of Tony. And on this large print, you can very easily see that that stick says Gretsch 3D Sunny Pain. Hmm. And um, there, uh, that interview that I mentioned before with Mike Clark, when he talks about seeing Tony for the first time in 1968, Mike Clark says he was playing the Gretsch 3D Sunny Payne model drumstick. Well, there you so, go. Yeah, so at yeah. least at it, it, this November 1963 and October 1968, Maybe just on those two dates, but we have evidence of him definitely using the Gretsch 3D Sunny Pain stick. Now, I just mm-hmm. happen to have three of these sticks that I um, I think I got all of these on eBay or Reverb. Um, I don't have three pairs. I just have three sticks. But you can see here that this yeah. is the Gretsch Sunny Pain 3D Sunny Pain stick. And this is a very interesting stick because it is very, very small. Um, it's about, it's 15 inches long, although these are, these are not all the same length, but they're about 15 inches long, which is very short. That's like a, a Firth uh, 7A is 15 and a half inches long, and that's a short stick. That's but a this small is, stick, yeah. This is a real, these are really, really, really small and you know they're they're the gri- the grip is very thin and they have this you can kind of see it if i put it up to my shirt um they have yeah. this tip that's sort of between a ball tip and a barrel tip it's like a slightly extended barrel tip maybe but a little rounder you can see mm. that yeah 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 so it's and it's a, those are those aren't even that consistent between those two no sticks, you can see funny. too these three sticks that are the same model or <laughs> they're all yeah. a little bit different from each other yeah but they're very, very light, very light. Um, and they do get a very sort of precise sound on the cymbal when I've tried mm. these. I, I'm very careful when I try them, but I have yeah, tried these yeah. on my kit. And, you know, they sound, you get a lot of stick. And it's interesting to think about his sound and his technique and the idea of him using these and how this may have affected his sound on his ride cymbal. Um, but I think it's, yeah, I think it's a pretty interesting thing. And th- this is another little sidebar about the Gretsch 3D model stick. But um, Steve Gadd in interviews has talked about how throughout the 70s, he was using this exact same model stick. There's an interview. The Sunny Pain 3D. Yeah, the Gretsch Sunny Pain model stick. He talks about, um, there's a Vic Firth interview where he talks about his signature model that he had been using a Gretsch Sunny Pain stick before that. And um, his original signature stick was actually made by Yamaha in the late seventies. Yamaha made this stick. This was mm. the, actually the, before the Firth stick came out, this was the original Steve Gadd signature stick. And it is not terribly dissimilar from if I take one of these, I mean, they're not that close, but, it's kind yeah, of similar. Same neighborhood. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, kind of, yeah. it's it's inspired by now. The the Gad stick is definitely longer, but it's in the same kind of family. And then the original Vic Firth stick, when that first came out around 83, was basically exactly the same as the uh as the Yamaha stick hmm. that preceded yeah. it. So you could say that Steve Gad's stick is actually kind of a variation on Tony's old stick from the yeah, 60s. Really? So kind of Which an Tony interesting gets lineage a signature there. stick, correct? When does well, that, when does that this happen? Is, it's, well, it's interesting you, you mentioned that because I mentioned um, Chris Bennett and um, from Bopworks Drumsticks. He did some research, and this is on his website. Um, he had found this, this stick that is – so it's basically – it says it's a 5A. The writing on it says Gretsch – Tony Williams 5A. But this stick is very odd because it has no tip. It basically has a taper and then it's like the tips were just sort of like cut off or not applied to the stick. And it's very, very bizarre. But if you look closely at the video that I talked about before of Tony playing with Stan Getz, 
in um, 1972 at Montreux, where he's playing Steve Gadd's kit and playing Peisty 2002 symbols, you can pretty clearly see he's using these tipless sticks. And also yeah, the video, yeah, the video of him with Jean Luc Ponty in 1972, you can also see he's using these sticks there. So this was mm. a stick that he used. Here's a photo of him. This was his vibe for a couple of years. Um, I don't know how long exactly, um, but. Interestingly, if we back up slightly, there are photos from Copenhagen in 71. There's one good photo where you can see pretty clearly. You can't see the logo, but if you know what the Gretsch 2B looks like, that is definitely a Gretsch 2B. It's a, it's a, it's a meaty stick. It's a 2B. It's a thick stick. But the Gretsch 2B had a very, very short and very extreme taper to this sort of arrowhead tip. But you can see how thin the tip, like just under the tip of the stick is very, very, very thin. So I assume he would still get very good rebound from this stick. So he's using that stick in 71, but then by 72, he has this completely different weirdo stick. Um, and then <laughs> I'm not sure exactly when, but certainly by the mid 70s, he is back to using Gretsch 2Bs. Um and there are various photos of sticks that people have collected over the years that they got from Tony or that they bought from Gretsch, you know, like, because Gretsch put these out. So this is technically a signature stick. It says Gretsch 2B Tony Williams, just like that earlier 5A. So this is yeah. sort of a custom stick, or at least it, it's got his name on it. And you can see that same sort of extreme taper happening here. Um, mm. Here is a, a, an 80 stick that's very well used. It says Gretsch, Tony Williams, same, more or less the same model, same sort of, you know, thin taper up there. Um, you can see how much he was playing the back end of the stick too. Yeah. Really um, totally. A lot of symbol up. crashes. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. cool. Um, here's another variant. Um, here's a, an eighties or nineties version of the stick with the red late what red writing and then this one up above it where, that just says Tony Williams and doesn't say Gretsch on it anywhere for whatever reason. Now, the next the ne the, the sort of final variation um, or the final chapter in this story is his Zildjian signature stick and I want to refer to um, my friend uh, uh, John De Christopher who was very very kind in um uh, giving me an incredible amount of information about his experiences with Tony and his experience uh, helping Tony develop this stick. John DeChristopher um, is an amazing guy who was, uh, among many other things, head of Zildjian's Artist Relations in the late 80s, into the 90s, into the 2000s. Um, and he has a wonderful podcast uh, called yeah. Live from My Drum Room, right? That's the name of the podcast. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Go follow and subscribe. Please, and yeah. Help. Yeah, it's a really, John. really wonderful podcast. He does amazing interviews. Um, similar to Bruce Wittett, who I mentioned before, you know, being a drummer, uh, John DeChristopher knows all of the right questions to ask fellow drummers, and the interviews are always yeah. very interesting. So John told me the story about how um, he was managing Zildjian's drumstick division which i think they started in sort of the mid 80s um mid to late 80s and they wanted to get um they had some endorsers but they wanted to get what he referred to i think as a flagship endorser um that you know they wanted a big 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 name to do a signature stick to have a signature stick and um I guess it was decided that they would go after Tony Williams because Tony was not with a major drumstick manufacturer. So um, it was decided that John would talk to Tony at um, Tony's appearance at the Modern Drummer Drum Festival in September of 1990. So they had arranged to have a meeting after his appearance at this festival. And John talked to him and Tony basically said, if you can make this stick for me, I will, I will be a Zildjian stick artist. You know, if you can make, he, he gave him a pair of his Gretsch sticks and said, if you can copy this, um, I'll play them. I, I think what John told me actually was, was the question that was asked in, at, at Zildjian was why doesn't Tony have a signature stick, you know, at this point, mm. like why, yeah. why isn't he with a major 
drumstick maker. So um, he became, they, they basically took that pair of sticks that he gave him and they copied it, um, got the spec just exactly right. And Tony was happy and said, yeah, let's go ahead. And they, he became the first sort of major Zildjian drumstick uh, signature artist. And later, like shortly after they got um, Vinnie Kaliuta, they got Dennis Chambers, um, yeah, they got they're Will, great sticks. Will Calhoun. I, I, they're fantastic yeah. sticks. I still, I use the Zildjian John Riley stick a lot. It's, it's, yeah. They're, yeah, they're, yeah. they're, they're wonderful sticks. And you can see from this ad that it is basically that same model. Um, it's that sort of 2B with a pretty extreme, a short and extreme taper. Um, and he, uh, the, 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 the type actually says in this, um, in this ad, uh, we started with our 2B and exaggerated the taper in the neck for a lighter feel at the top end. An acorn shaped bead was added to bring out more definition from those signature ride patterns. And to withstand a powerful style, we designed our stick to carry more weight yet remain responsive. So that's basically, you know, kind of that's it, yeah. what we see from that Gretsch 2B as well. And that is, you know, that became his signature stick. And, and, um, yeah, and that's that's the story of the sticks. Man, Paul, this is uh, incredible, man. So we started talking about all of this and doing this in July of 2023. <laughs> it's November. Tomorrow's Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Happy it Thanksgiving. Is, uh, it has been a <laughs> happy Thanksgiving. It has been a journey um, to do this, but just s- s- a huge thank you to you, obviously, for putting the amount of work and time into this. And I hope you feel, um, you know, I think people appreciate it very much from the comments, but I hopefully you, you know, this will live forever. So you should be proud to get this information out there. I I hope so. Yeah. I mean this, you know, this stuff is not particularly well documented and it's all stuff that I've pieced together from all sorts of different resources. And, um, uh, and, and I think at the very least, it's nice to have it all in one place. And, um, uh, I hope that my information that I've given you is, is I, I mean, I try to be as accurate as possible. I'm trying really hard not to speculate. Um, I, I, again, I want to really thank, um, oh, there's a lot of people to thank. I mentioned John to Christopher. Um, I want to you know, have to thank and give massive respect to Wallace Roney um, and also to, uh, to Lenny White, to Mike Clark, um, uh, some of the writers, Bruce Whittet, Rick Mattingly. Um, uh, there's just uh, so much amazing info out there and so many great resources. So it was, it, it was, you know, I gotta, uh, I gotta credit Jess Birch, um, and Steve Maxwell for their help with this. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm probably going to yeah, forget, totally. probably forgetting somebody, but you know, it's nice. I I'm hoping it'll be good to have, you know, all of the stuff, at least in, in it's four episodes, but all of the stuff hopefully will live <laughs> on as long as YouTube lives on. We'll yes, have this stuff. exactly. Well, thank you to your wife for letting you, uh, you know, t- take up this portion of your house. And, and we, we, man, we've, hours. we've done a lot of them now. Uh, hours. Yeah, hours, and hours and hours. Yeah. She's, she's extremely patient. <laughs> yes. And, um, my, and your my, cat. Thank my you cat, to your cat. My cat, not so much. He's, you know, he's kind of given up on trying to get my attention at this point. Yeah, that's good. Well, um, thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you to Scott Garrison for coming on on part three. Um, If you have listened to all these episodes, be sure to comment and let us know, because I think it's cool when people have listened to the entire series. Um, So it's been it's when this is released and out, it'll be a month of Tony. So uh, (laughs) I guess this episode will conclude the month of Tony. Um, But it's, you know, Tony's Tony's worth it, man. I mean, he's absolutely one of the most important drummers of all time and you know i i, I mean for me he's uh, you know him and elvin kind of swap places as my number one favorite and my number two favorite they're kind of constantly going like this and he's yeah. massively important to me he's massively important to so many of us and i just think he deserves this sort of deep dive and it seems like people dig it so uh, really, really happy that people are listening. And, and I really, really, really hope that it encourages people to go and listen to Tony Williams. Listen, listen, yeah. listen to as much Tony Williams as possible. And if yeah. you want to learn to play like Tony Williams, the only way to do that is to listen to him. Listen, listen, listen. Get that sound in your head and then try to replicate it. 
Um, it's, it's, yeah. you know, their transcriptions. That's great. You know, you can watch videos. It's cool to see him, but the, your ears are what's going to tell you what you're hearing. The your ears getting that sound through your ears into your brain is the way to really internalize it. So listen to Tony, yeah. listen, listen, listen. He's the best. Absolutely. That's what Garrison said too. He said, close your eyes and just listen. And, yeah, uh, man. Makes a lot of sense. So, um, all right, Paul. Well, this has been an incredible man. Uh, I won't say anything now, but you and I have something that we're kind of planning to do as another one, maybe in 2024. We'll we'll, we'll work on that one later. Um, I'm sure you'll be back, but let's take yeah. a break for a while. Yeah, yeah. I can and, use a little uh, break, but yeah, looking forward yes, me to, too. Uh, to meeting again. Yes. Okay. Well, thanks to everyone for watching. Thanks to everyone who helped and was involved. All the people Paul listed and more. Um, but uh, Paul, Thank you for being here and have a great rest of 2023. Thank you, Bart. Same to you. Happy holidays.